Welcome to Behind the Scenes, Fair Trade Apparel. We're really pleased to be having this conversation on the first day of Fashion Revolution Week, um, really launching into this week of awareness campaigns and conversation about fair trade and ethical and sustainable apparel, um, what that means, why it matters, and what we all as consumers can do to participate and support that movement. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to provide just a little bit of background on what Fashion Revolution Week is about and is in commemoration of. So today marks the first day of Fashion Revolution Week. Um, it has been going on for about six years at this point, and it's the, the last week of April, around April 24th. Um, and the, the movement really grew out of and in response to the Rana Plaza factory collapse that happened in Bangladesh in April of 2013. Um, the building collapse killed over a thousand people, injured several thousand more, um, and it was a major industrial disaster and really raised a lot of awareness and, and made a lot of people start to speak up about where their clothes are made, what are the working conditions of the individuals making those products, uh, and what we all as consumers and consumer advocates can do to take a stand um, and demand more and demand better from apparel manufacturers. Um, and a lot of that conversation and demand has really come up online. Um, you know, in our hashtag activism era, we, we have a lot of power to speak to and at brands on Twitter and Instagram and elsewhere. Um, so if anyone's curious and following that conversation or joining it throughout the week, um, I would encourage you to follow and use the hashtag who made my clothes, um, as well as the we wear fair trade hashtag that, that fair trade USA is working under this week. Um, there's a lot more information at fashionrevolution.org if anyone's interested in learning more after this call. Um, but for the, the time being, I will introduce our, our speakers and turn it over to them to give us the, the background on fair trade certification, fair trade verification, and what that looks like in the context of apparel. So it is my pleasure to introduce two speakers today. Um, sharing two different sides of the fair trade apparel uh, space, looking at the fair trade verification on the one hand and fair trade certification and fair trade factories on the other. So, introducing from Mata Traders, uh, we have joining us Jonit Bookheim. She's the director of sales and marketing at Mata Traders, which is a pioneering ethical fashion label, which is celebrating its 12th year in business. Congratulations. Uh, after graduating from college, Janit took the first of many trips to India with her friends Michelle and Maureen, Mata's co-founders. Since then, she's played an integral role in transforming a DIY-style grassroots fashion line into a globally recognized fair trade business, which is making a real impact on poverty and gender equality. Before joining Mata full-time, Janit earned her master's degree in sustainable development and worked for a service organization supporting homeless and underprivileged citizens in Chicago, where Mata is based. Also joining us today, we're pleased to have Allison Feet. Since early 2016, Allison has worked on the Fair Trade USA factory certification program. Her current role is a brand partnership manager, where she works directly with apparel brands that support Fair Trade certified factory programs. Prior to working at Fair Trade USA, Allison lived and worked in Thailand, focused on international development working primarily with refugee and migrant communities in Myanmar. So thank you very much to Janit and Allison for joining us and sharing their knowledge with us today. Um, so to start us off, it's my pleasure to turn things over to Allison to talk more about Fairtrade Certified's factory program. Hello everyone. Um, Thanks for the wonderful introduction, Susie. My name is Allison Fite. I've been working at Fair Trade on the factory program for the past couple of years and excited to share some information about it with you today. So starting, um, I just wanna start with an overview of what is Fair Trade. In general, Fair Trade is a movement to incorporate those that make and grow our products into the business 
success of a product. Um, there are lots of different ways to achieve this mission, um, but there's common principles that are shared across um, a lot of the different organizations that work in the different supply chains. Um, the principles are safe working conditions, uh, that, that business should result in the advancement of people, that there should be protections for the planet and business, and that consumers need to be involved and activated so that they can support better business decisions. Today, I'm representing Fairtrade USA. We are a certifier of goods. And what that means is that um, whenever you see a Fairtrade certified label on a product, you know that that product was made or grown according to rigorous social and environmental standards, and that the people who produced that um, product earned more with every sale. So we began working in coffee supply chains back in 1998, providing market access to smallholder farmers. And since then, we've expanded into a wide variety of other agricultural supply chains, such as cocoa, tea, produce, um, coconut water, uh, floral, and then today, now working in other manufacturing supply chains, including apparel. And we are now in 30 different product categories, from Fairtrade certified seafood uh, to Fairtrade certified wetsuits. And, uh, those products in 2017, there's 42 million fair trade certified labels in market, which is increasing consumers' recognition and their understanding of the fair trade program. Today, about 63% of US consumers recognize our fair trade certified label, which stands for these principles. So, how do we do this? Um, it starts with our partnerships with our brands. Today, we have 1,200 different brands supporting the Fair Trade Certified Program. And collectively, because they support Fair Trade and have Fair Trade products, they've sent back over $500 million in additional income to farmers and workers since 1998. For our apparel partners, we have two different programs that our uh, brands can support the first being cotton, and the second one being a Fair Trade Certified Factory Program. The cotton program, um, the benefits of the fair trade program specifically go back to improve uh, market access and benefit to farming communities, while the factory um, certification focuses on the four wall facility where products are manufactured and built. So the fair trade certified factory program um, began in 2010 with a multi-stakeholder group pilot program. We, we spent a lot of time testing if fair trade certified programs can work in the factory setting. Um, through a lot of consultation, we launched our, our factory standard and certified our first factory in 2012. Today, we have 50 different factories that are certified and additional 45 that have been nominated for fair trade certification by their brand partners. To summarize where we're at today, there's over 75,000 factory employees that are benefiting from safe working conditions and additional income in our program. We have 18 million certified products since our program inception and market. And in 2018 alone, these fair trade products sent back $5.5 million in fair trade premium. So the big question, how does fair trade factory certification work? It all starts with the working conditions at a factory. For every single one of our fair trade factories, we have in-country consultants that work with the factory on the ground to address issues of working conditions in their factory, and then create improvement plans and provide consultation services and guidance to the factory to improve sustainably and, re and remediate these issues over time. Beyond that, we have third-party audit teams that go in and assess these factories against our fair trade factory standard. And this is done on an annual basis. The audits are semi-announced, um, and they, they test for everything um, from temperature in the ground floor to forced labor in the factory. Where we go really above and beyond some of the other factory certifications that you might hear about is around economic development, worker engagement, women's rights, and a big component around environmental management. Once a factory is certified, uh, brands have the ability to support a fair trade certified factory program. Um, that means that the brands are committing to paying a little bit of extra money on top of the cost of their goods. So on top of the business, they send back money that accrues in a worker managed bank account. In addition to working conditions, our standard covers um, a, a piece around worker representation. At every one of our factories, there's a fair trade certified uh, excuse me, a fair trade committee that is democratically elected by their peers. And this committee is responsible for the management of that fair trade premium funds that the brand is sending back. 
And the way that they, they use the fair trade premium funds is they first conduct a process that we call the needs assessment. Um, that typically consists of surveys where they're uh, gathering information from their workforce community to figure out what are some of the, the greatest challenges and what are some of the greater needs in that community. Do they have access to education, healthcare, water, food, et cetera? You can actually see on the bottom right hand side of the screen, this is the implementation of a survey at a factory in Pakistan. And the goal of these surveys is to understand what are the shared challenges so that the workforce can then use the fair trade premium one that the brands are sending back to address these issues. Ultimately, the workforce gets to vote on the projects that get implemented with the money. And then um, they actually move forward and implement these projects on site. So here you can see uh, some of the examples of the way the fair trade premium funds have been sent by workforces, purchasing dry rations, buying bicycles, building a daycare center so that working moms can still come to work and not lose their job because they have children, washing machines, healthcare center, water filters, etc. So, so to summarize the fair trade program, we have this piece of our, around social compliance or working in the factory. We have this additional component around worker well-being where we have representation, benefit, and voice. And then the last piece, which is really important that I wanna um, make sure that we end on today is talking about the commitment of the fair trade commitment um, and communicating that to your customers or to a brand's customers. And we support brands to do this, whether it's on product, on website, on catalog, to help consumers more easily, um, consumers like you and I, shop fair trade products and create more demand through fair trade through our pur purchases. Thank you so much, Allison. I appreciate the, the background and overview of the, the fair trade factory program, fair trade certification. You know, there's, there's a lot of complexity and detail in there as we're following this from the implementation at factory all the way through to the support of brands to communicate that impact to consumers, um, customers at the store and online. Um, really, really appreciate all of the, the detail there. Um, and I, as I said, it is complex. There's a lot of facets and components here. So for anyone who has further questions about how that certification works, we will have time for Q&A at the end of this webinar. Um, feel free to post your questions in the chat. I see someone sharing already there. Um, so we can uh, hold on to those and, and get to the, as many as we can as we get towards the end. Um, so thank you for that, Allison. And we'll, we'll look forward to hearing more about impact in just a moment. Uh, Great. Through. Thank you, Susie. All right. So up next, we have Janit joining us from Mata Traders to, to share more about the work that Mata does and Fair Trade Federation's verification system. Hi, everyone. So my, I'm, my name is Janit, and I'm one of the owners of Mata Traders. And we're a fair trade fashion brand based in Chicago, and we design and produce apparel and jewelry collections. And I'm also on the board of the Fair Trade Federation. So Sorry. it's that capacity today that I'm talking to you about how FTF members conduct business and I'll try to point out specific ways that those rules relate to apparel production. Um, so first, I just want to start with kind of a basic definition. Um, so what is fair trade and how does the Fair Trade Federation define it? It's basically business for good, it's business as a way to create a stable income for those who need it. It's um, a business model that puts people before profit and ensures that everyone is benefiting from the trading relationship. So the current sort of dominating model of international trade is for companies to have one commitment, which is to their shareholders. Um, so the goal would be increasing profits and generating returns for shareholders. And one major way to do that, of course, is to drive down costs particularly labor costs, because that's one area that can be pressured. Other costs are more fixed, like materials and transportation. So fair trade rejects that model, and it's set up to be the opposite, which is bringing equity to the trading system, including gender equity, and specifically partnering with producers who need partners with mar market access. So small-scale farmers and craftspeople whose livelihoods are challenged and under pressure from the global system. So the FTF version of fair trade comes out of a tradition of handcraft and small, small farmers, small producers. 
um, bigger systems are able to sort of squeeze them out and relegate them to the margins. And so fair trade is a way for small producers to organize and work together to compete and, and then do business with companies that have access to markets. So FDF members are filling a need, which is market access for handcraft producers and small farmers. Um, an example related to apparel uh, might be textile producers who have lost a lot of market share to factory production. Um, most textiles are made in factories these days on a large scale, but in fair trade, you'll see the use of traditional craft techniques like hand woven textiles made on looms or hand block printing. And those are two types of fabrics that we use here at Mata Traders. Um, other examples might be um, Ghanaian batik production that um, is used by one of the FTF members, Global Mamas, and then uh, Mexican embroidery from another FTF member, Nativa. So I have a little video of an example that I took of one of our hand block printing um, producer groups. <laughs> On the shelves behind him, all the blocks um, from past, you know, past fabrics they produce. This kind of craft is something that's passed on from generation to generation. And so, over all those years, they have all these blocks. Awesome, thank you. Um, so what is FTF membership? Um, I want to point out that the Fair Trade Federation is a trade association within the US and Canada. And in order to be accepted as a member, a business must demonstrate full commitment to nine fair trade principles of doing business, which I'll go over in just a sec. Um, not only that, a, co a core purpose behind the business or the reason it exists, and every decision must be motivated by that reason, is the economic support and empowerment of the producer, not the shareholder. Um, so that means doing business with people in traditionally marginalized communities and addressing the usual trade imbalances and vulnerabilities in order to make power in the trading relationship more equitable. Um, so the next one, the next slide, uh, and I think you guys will get a copy of this too, so you can always go back and read more details. Um, these are the nine principles that Fair Trade Federation members commit to incorporating into their business practices. And um, that link there, there's tons more information about every single principle on the Fair Trade Federation website, so I encourage you to check that out. Um, that first, Principle, creating opportunities for economically and socially, mar socially marginalized farmers and artisans. It's about place, our businesses are about placing the interests of producers and their communities as the primary concern of our businesses. And the next two, develop transparent and accountable relationships and building capacity of producers and their communities. I think a key to this is that Fair Trade Federation members have a commitment to long-term partnerships working together with producers to solve problems and improve product to build capacity for quality and marketability. So we're not gonna change our suppliers based on fashion trends or finding someone who can make it cheaper. We're committed to ongoing business with our suppliers and working through problems. So at Mata Traders, we work with four fair trade producer groups that make our apparel and one that makes our jewelry. And they're different in various ways, but one thing that they all have in common is that they're providing training and job opportunities in their own communities. They're organizations that provide more than just a job. The training encompasses the skills that they need for the job, such as sewing, but it also includes training in life skills and continuing education in other areas like parenting and hygiene and sanitation, financial literacy, and topics such as domestic violence and child abuse. So they're doing the production work, but they're also doing social work and providing holistic approach to change in their communities. And so for Mata, they have this commitment that will return to them every season with the goal of maintaining or even increasing our orders with them. 
Um, another uh, important principle to point out is number five, which is paying promptly and fairly. So this principle ensures fair pay, but there's another part of this principle which makes a big difference when trying to correct power imbalances, and that's when people get paid. So it's common for buyers to get net 30, net 60, or net 90 terms from suppliers, and that means that the buyer doesn't have to pay for the goods for 30, 60, or 90 days after they receive them, which gives them some time to sell the product. So from a vulnerability standpoint, that means that it's the, the artisan has paid for the materials, put in their hours of work before they actually see any payment. And so fair trade corrects for this by paying for product up front. So with Mata Traders producers, we pay 50% when we place our purchase order, and then we pay, pay the rest, the other 50% when we receive the product. So we've paid 100% before we've made any sales. And so, um, the artisans have the funding to purchase the materials before production, and then they have no risk if the items don't sell because they've already been paid. Um, another principle that I wanted to call attention to, um, supporting safe and empowering working conditions free of discrimination, harassment, and forced labor. FTF members support workplaces that empower producers to participate in decision making. Um, the organizations that MATA partners with have artisans that hold seats on their boards and make sure that their voices and concerns are represented. Um, often fair trade producers are organized as cooperatives or collectives, and so there's participation in profit sharing. And what we do see is that there are very supportive workplaces for women in particular. Three of our apparel producers are women's cooperatives, and what we've seen and heard from them is um, in a, you know, in a society where women don't usually work outside the home, uh, the women who are working there grow more confident and take on leadership positions at work and at home and in their community. And it's really awesome to see that. Um, one last thing I wanted to point out, out about these principles, um, and in the in considering our time is sort of short, so I'm just kind of going through them quickly, but. Um, Ensuring the rights of children by never using exploitative child labor. Um, it's actually something that's very common in the handcraft industry because it's unregulated. It's, factories are regulated, but the handcraft sector is pretty unregulated, particularly jewelry making, and that's where you see a lot of child labor because um, their small hands are good at assembling small pieces. And um, so obviously that's something that is totally not allowed in fair trade, but what we actually do see happening in fair trade is that the women who are making an independent income tend to spend their money on their children's education. Like when you ask them, you know, what are you doing with your wages? That's what they're doing. They're sending their kids to school and even to college, and that's where the real change happens and the cycle of poverty is broken. So I do encourage you to read more detail about those principles on the FTF website, and I want to talk to you next about the verification process. Um, so it is a pretty rigorous application process that relies on self-reporting to become a member of the Fair Trade Federation. We have three anonymous screening committees that review all the businesses that are applying to be members, businesses based in the US or Canada, and um, we're looking at how they vet their producers. So the committees are verifying how businesses have built those principles, those nine principles, into their day-to-day -day business operations, how that's a core part of their business practices, and the onus is on the applicant to demonstrate how they built those systems into how they work and how they use the principles to vet their trading relationships. And these memberships are renewed annually. Um, from all of our F the FTF members, these are some of the elements you can expect from um, FTF members and their products, which is a very holistic approach to fair trade. Um, and then in particular, if you want to slip to the next slide, um, apparel, there are about 35 members of, of the FTF that sell apparel out of about 250. Um, and what's special about FTF apparel is that, um, for one thing, a very direct supply chain. I think um, apparel in particular, but a lot of products have, you know, contractors and they're 
very, very long and opaque supply chains. And what's um, exciting about the way that FTX conducts fair trade is that we have very, the buyer and the supplier have a direct relationship, a long-term relationship. Um, and we really do get to know our suppliers over the years. Um, the buyer is there with the artisans regularly. Um, new negotiations are direct and transparent. Costing is transparent. Um, it's also unusual to see factory style production lines. Um, none of our apparel is made on a production line. Rather, one woman sews an entire garment. So she has all the pieces of the garment and puts it together. And the, the reason is not for efficiency's sake. Um, it's actually because the producer comes first. And so if there's, you can't make a production line if someone's going to be going home early because she has to pick up her kids or um, if someone's slower than another, you know, it, it allows for different levels of um, ability and, um, you know, no, no one's going to be kicked out for not meeting a quota or they're not going to lose their job for sewing more slow than what's um, standard. There are, I wanted to point out, um, there are three members that sell blank t-shirts if you're in need of that. Um, from an FTF member, Freeset, Maggie, and Goek. Um, so I think that's it for my explanation of fair trade membership and verification. Yeah. And I'm sure there'll be questions later. Yes, thank you so much, Janet, for all of that background. Um, we will definitely get into questions later. I've seen a few coming through in the, the chat here. So we'll, we'll keep collecting your questions there. Um, before we move into the Q&A, though, we are going to look a little bit more at the impact of everything that we just heard about. So, you know, the, the certification, the verification, um, we see those labels here at point of purchase uh, and really wanted to get our speakers to share a bit more about what that looks like on the ground um, within these artisan communities, within fair trade factories. Um, so I will turn things back over to Allison first to talk more about the impact of, of the Fairtrade certification in our factory program at Fairtrade USA. All right, great, thanks Susie. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited to share with you a couple stories. And the real richness of the Fairtrade certified factory program, yes, working conditions to me are baseline important um, to being able to have a thriving um, workplace community, but um, to me, it's the dialogue and the discussion um, that happens through the fair trade program that's unique in the factory and the manufacturing sector today. Um, so I'm gonna start with the needs assessment process. I actually saw a question come through around what is the needs assessment and how does it exactly work? So to recap, um, the needs assessment typically is led by the fair trade committee and they, um, do group discussions and surveys to try to understand what are some of the issues that are going on at the factory that might not be um, common knowledge uh, and provides an opportunity for factory management and the fair trade committee to come together to discuss these things. So I'm going to highlight a factory in Thailand where they did the needs assessment and through the surveys and group discussions they found that there was two major issues um, that the workforce there had problems with. And the first one is language, and the second one is financial resiliency. And the interesting thing about this factory um, is that the majority of the workforce there are actually migrants from Burma. So um, about 75% uh, of the factory there, factory workers there, don't speak Thai. So it's not a surprise that what came from the needs Hi. assessment, hello? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, go ahead, Allison. Sorry, I heard something in the background. I thought it was a question. Okay, so the um, what was really interesting is that although it would it's it sounds obvious that there are going to be issues with language at a factory where the majority of the workforce doesn't um, speak Thai because they're from another country, it creates that space for factory management and the workforce to talk about what are some of the actual issues that not being able to speak the language um, creates. And so what they found is that, um, if you could just click one more time, Susie, thanks. So what they, what they found is that 
some of the major issues were around going to the hospital. So um, migrants in Thailand are highly stigmatized um, because there is a, a, a growing sentiment of, of anti-immigration to the country. And so a lot of the, the migrants would go to the hospitals and not be able to communicate properly with their doctors um, and also might not get proper care because they didn't have somebody who was there, a Thai person there representing them. So they decided to use the fair trade premium funds, the workforce voted, um, on translators for Bi Burmese migrants to go to hospitals, um, as well as government local buildings whenever they have to go and fill out paperwork and renew um, associated documents that have to do with their, their migrant status. So that's been a real benefit for the community there um, and helped create some shared understanding of what are the true challenges. Another thing that they've used the fair trade premium funds at this particular factory is um, starting an education scholarship for K-12 students. As you can see on the left hand side, those are some of the students that received the scholarship. Um, and they also started a Friends Help Friends program, which is a program that I love. Um, there was a female worker there who was pregnant and not able to um, cover her financial costs of her pregnancy. And so the fair trade committee there decided to use the fair trade premium funds to support her financial costs um, and then have now created a consecutive year over year program called Friends Help Friends, where um, anybody at the factory can apply for a scholarship or uh, apply for um, financial support in times of emergency. Um, and then the last thing that they've done multiple times each year is have sports days at the factory where they all have um, uniforms and they have sports and um, get to play games and build community at the factory. Can you go to the next screen? Thank you. Um, just to share uh, a couple other examples of how a factory in India has used their fair trade premium funds. Um, they have actually built a welfare shop on site at the factory. They use the fair trade premium fund to purchase a lot of um, goods that they would buy in local stores, but now provide those goods and sell them at um, lower than market value. So the workforce has the ability to go and purchase goods less than what they would buy at the local store, and it's right at their factory, saving them time and money every day. Um, now that uh, welfare shop actually sustains itself through business and twice per year around um, two cultural uh, fest festivals, they actually give coupons out to the workforce to get free goods from the shop. Um, also, a large portion of the workforce there travels multiple hours every day to get to work. So the workforce there decided to use premium funds to have daily free breakfast. Um, and that enables the workforce that have woke up at four o'clock in the morning or something along these lines that drove multiple hours to get another um, substantial food before they start their work day. Um, they've also done a higher education scholarship. They've, they've held health clinics. The most recent one was an eye clinic. And um, they've also uh, done multiple field trips, um, building community at the factory. And one of the things that I want to end on is, is the unique um, opportunity here for the workforce to be able to take money that they earned because of their their hard work creating quality cr products um, and receiving that value from the brand to address their own community challenges in whatever best way they see fit and at every one of our factories um, the the projects and the, the ways that they end up wanting to utilize the fair trade premium funds is so different um, and it's, it's just really exciting to see what they come up with. It's most of the time a surprise to, to me. And then when I understand the cultural context behind it, I really see, think of like, wow, that was really innovative and smart and something I never would have guessed. And so putting the decision-making power um, into the hands of the people at the factory to improve um, their communities is really to the core of the Fair Trade Certified Factory Program. That's it. Wonderful. Thank you, Allison, for all of that. Um, Allison did provide some contact information here. If um, folks have follow-up questions, they can contact the Apparel and Home Goods team at Fairtrade USA, um, and we'll I'll put the email up again at the end of the call as well. Um, so thanks for the the background on how these these committees are using the the premium funds. It's it's interesting to see that balance of you know the the medical and needs being met, education access, and then also some really personal 
community building opportunities like the, the sports day and the field trips. Um, it's a, a really wonderful balance. Um, so shifting back over to Jonit, we will look at impact from the perspective of the, the artisans working with uh, Mata Traders and the, the Fair Trade Federation. Okay, so yeah, I just figured, um, you know, the, the groups we work with, they are so super amazing and doing all this incredible work, um, providing training and other educational opportunities, um, healthcare, and uh, I actually happened upon an eye clinic day myself at one of our groups at one point. Um, uh, so I thought maybe one of the best ways to share about it is in their own words. So I just um, put up a few, a couple videos for you guys to see. So the first video is, um, well, let's just play it and then I can give you an intro to the other one.
Yeah, so um, the next couple videos are one of the women that was in that first video. Um, she gave us a really great interview, like telling us all about um, her situation. So she's part of um, a, a sewing group that was started by um, a women's, it was at first a women's employment project of a local NGO. And then the workshop was so successful that it became its own organization. And they began to set up small embroidery groups in outlying areas. So the garments are stitched in the city, but then they go out into um, sort of outlying areas, more remote villages to, um, to get hand embroidered. Um, and so Choti, she was part, one of the first members of this embroidery group in her town. Um, and there was originally 17 women, and now there are 250 women who are taking part in this sewing group, in this embroidery group. Um, and one of the coolest parts about her story is how much they've been able to achieve together. Like the group of women um, are able to organize and stand up for themselves and really have a voice among the local government officials. So when there's problems in the community, they work together um, to you know, demand action. So it's really um, cool. So that's why I wanted to share this video. या किसी टैंकर से पानी मंगवाएंगे दो सौ रुपए चाहिए ना अगर हम वो दो सौ रुपए का काम भी नहीं करेंगे दो दो घंटे तक हम हैंडपंप पे एक मटकी भरने के लिए हम सुबह से शाम तक लाइन लगाते थे तो हम ये काम को कब करेंगे आप बताइए हम करते हैं और ये हमारे बच्चों के लिए हमारे घर के लिए करेंगे जब हम सरपंच के पास गए तो उन्होंने कह दिया मुझे नहीं पता प्रधान के पास गए तो मुझे नहीं पता फिर उसके बाद में हमने रोड जाम किया अब आप बताइए आप क्या करना है तब जाके उन्होंने दो घंटे में दो तीन गाड़ियाँ भेज के सारे हैंडपम्प ठीक कर जानी तो बहुत सारी चीज़ें की जिससे हमने संघर्ष किया दिलवाड़ा के स्कूलों में बच्चे और बच्चों के लिए वो बाहर निकल जाते थे टीचर टाइम से नहीं आते थे क्यों नहीं आते सरकारी पैसे लेते हो आप बच्चों को पढ़ाओ ना आप अंग्रेजी तीसरे से शुरू आप क्या पढ़ाते हो तो ये सारे जाके हमने किए सब स्कूलों में जाते थे हॉस्पिटल में दवाइयाँ नहीं देते थे उनसे अड़ जाते थे क्यों भाई फ्री में आ रहे हैं क्यों नहीं दे रहे हो आप क्या परेशानी है आपकी वही बात है कि जब तक आप किसी को जोर से नहीं करें। नहीं कहेंगे ना और काम नहीं होता ये सारे किए सर तब जाके उनको लगा नहीं ये महिलाएं बहुत स्ट्रॉन्ग हैं और ये हमसे अड़ सकती हैं तो हमें अपना काम करना ही चाहिए Yep, and then last is just a little bit um, more about when she, her talking about the change in mindset as far as educating daughters. So I want to share that. मेरी बेटी को मैंने ना फाइनल कराया बीएड कराया उसको अभी भी पढ़ रही है और बेटा पढ़ रहा है सेकंड ईयर और छोटा वाला इलेवन ट्वेल्व पढ़ रहा है ओके तो ये सब सोच सब पढ़ रहे हैं सब पढ़े वो सोच है कि मैं अच्छा पढ़ाऊँ अपनी बेटी को ज़्यादा पढ़ाऊँ और उसकी नौकरी करे वो सरकारी सर्विस करे टीचर की तैयारी कर रही है वो हाँ हाँ वो अच्छा है हाँ। तो सभी लोग जितने भी हैं ना सभी बेटियों पे सबसे ज्यादा ध्यान देते हैं आज की तारीख बच्चे लड़कियां हैं रोटी सब्जी बनाना खाना बनाना हाँ। वो था फिर हाँ। वो नहीं है या वो अभी वो चेंज हो रहा है साथ में या सो इफ यू गाइस हैव एनी क्वेश्चंस ऑफ कोर्स यू कैन आई थिंक वी हैव अ लिटल टाइम ओनली अबाउट 15 minutes left to, for questions, but um, you guys can always reach out to us um, via email or on social media, etc. if you have questions. Hey, thank you so much, Janit, and thank you again, Allison, for, for all of that. Really wonderful to hear from the artisans themselves and get that um, more you know, firsthand perspective and view into what the, the partners you're working with in India are really asking for and experiencing. Um, so we do have, as Janet said, about 10-15 um, minutes for questions. I've seen a few come through in the chat here. While folks think about what questions you might have, I do want to start with a couple that came through the chat as we were, were talking. Um, and the, the first, there's a couple of questions in here about factory certification in the U.S. Um, and how that domestic fair trade component um, really takes effect. Um, so I think, Allison, that one might be over to you to get us started. Sure. Yeah, so um, in the factory program, we have one uh, fair trade certified factory in the U.S. It's called Nature USA. It's located in L.A. 
Um, as for agricultural farms, I don't specifically work on those programs, but we do have, I believe, Fair Trade certified tomatoes and strawberries, um, Fair Trade programs that are led by our produce team. Um, for the, in, in terms of um, where the breakdown of the majority of our factories are, it's all uh, led by brands. So brands nominate our factories for certification. And so the majority of the brands that we work with today um, have, just due to the, the typical labor market, have their factories in, um, in either Latin America or Asia. Um, so we began working in India with our first Fair Trade certified factory, and that's actually where our largest concentration of factories is today. Um, but where we see the most growth and the most factories in the coming years is Vietnam and China. And there are some regions, just to clarify, that we're not working in today, like uh, Bangladesh and Cambodia, um, that we would eventually like to be able to expand into, um, but we have to do a lot of um, uh, thoughtful due diligence prior to expanding into these countries due to the labor challenges in these countries, um, which requires, requires feasibility studies, et cetera, before we can launch our standard um, to ensure the integrity of our program as we expand. Great, thank you, Allison. Um, and it, it sounds like I saw a question here from Nicholas as well about um, smaller factories in the US getting certified. So it sounds like it's the um, brand sort of stepping in to request that and then working with Fairtrade USA to, to make that happen um, and move through the certification process, correct? Correct, yeah. Um, there are some requirements that we have around factory nomination. Um, first, uh, a long-term relationship. So we don't accept applications to nominate a factory if a, if a brand recently started working with a factory. Um, the program is provides a lot of value to the workforce at that factory, that all that additional money that's going back. And it also requires a lot of investment on behalf of the factory management um, to get the program up and running. So we only want to um, turn on fair trade programs and get the workforce excited about extra premium, um, going back to them unless we are um, more secure in the fact that there'll be a sustainable program there over, long, over the long term. And what that means is that brand has to have a long-term relationship with that factory um, and it's a factory that they want to invest in. Great, thank you. Um, so another question in here that, that I would really turn over to either of you, Janit or Allison, um, and I'd, I'd be curious from Mata's perspective on this as well, um, someone asking about using post-consumer upcycled cotton, um, sort of that balance of the, the fair trade principles and certification with this um, movement around reuse, recycling, um, you know, is, is there work happening that, that either of you are seeing in that space? Yeah, I think that, um, well, with the FTF, the requirement is that there's fair trade on, on at least one point in the supply chain. And for handmade products, it's generally that point of production. But there are a lot of members who are um, cognizant of raw material inputs and are really looking to in, bring in um, recycled products or materials more, or um, organic, like God's, God's fabrics and things like that. So um, every member is different. Um, and then, so some people are using, definitely there are members that are using um, scrap. I know that Tone Light is an FTF member that uses the remnants from factories. So it's like kind of a waste material um, to develop a lot of their garments. Um, so yeah, def there's definitely um, environmental stewardship is one of the principles, and so people are trying to figure more ways to um, improve that in their supply chain. For our jewelry, we do use upcycled bone, which is like a waste product of the food industry, and it's a um, government-run market in Delhi, and the artisans go and buy the actual bone and then carve them into jewelry. So. Um, for I can speak a little bit about upcycled materials and um, related to the Fair Trade Certified Program. Um, right now, we so re recycled uh, materials 
although we um, definitely love <laughs> that brands do that, it doesn't fit into our Fair Trade Certified Cotton program. A lot of our products that are fair, made in a Fair Trade Certified factory, um, providing those benefits to the factory workforce, are made with recycled or upcycled cotton products, but the cotton itself isn't certified. So I just want to ensure that um, when we look at uh, a typical supply chain for an apparel product, um, the, the two environments where there are the most amount of people are at the cotton farm and then also at the, the factory space space most of the agents along the supply chain um, require a lot of machinery and are more automated than what you see in the beginning of the supply chain at the end of the supply chain um, and so that's why when looking at our standards we have two different standards that address that because our, our program is socially focused um, so for fair trade certified cotton we don't have an option for that because we're actually supporting the cotton farmers that are um, getting that cotton or growing that cotton um, what we do, similar um, to what Janita just said, for a spinoff, when at the at the spinner, when the cotton is being spun into thread, um, extra cotton that's thrown off, we allow to be made into um, additional byproducts, and that can be labeled as fair trade. But it has to come from a fair trade certified cotton in the first place. Great, thank you both for that. Um, so we have a, a big question here in the chat that I want to queue up for you um, asking about the really the difference between these two you know certification versus verification um, and wondering if there ends up being any competition in that supply chain between these two related but different processes that are also working with um, different groups different producer groups um, so I want to Cue that up for both of you to think on um, and also just want to make sure the folks on the phone have a chance since they aren't able to access the chat box. Um, if there's anyone who has uh, any other questions they want to put out for the last couple of minutes of our call. Um, I'd say that the Anna who wrote the question does have a pretty, I mean, I would agree that that is how those models differ. So the Fair Trade Federation um, is about the commitment of the whole company to certain principles, like these nine principles, and prioritizing market access for artisans and small scale farmers, um, farmer owned organizations, and artisan owned organizations, and um, building capacity there. And I think um, what Fair Trade USA's certification program is looking at bigger scale operations, factories, and plantations, and um, ensuring that the labor there is fair and safe, but also adding that additional premium, giving the workers or our, the farmers um, a degree of autonomy over this fund, these funds that are additional. So. Um, I think they're, it, it's true that they have the same name, Fair Trade, um, and they're, they are kind of different, but I think the similar goals, which is um, that this, you know, balancing the trade relationships and making sure that everybody's benefiting in the supply chain. Yeah, I think that was really well said. Um, I love this question. <laughs> um, I, to me, there's no competition in fair trade. The more fair trade, the better. We have a wide, across all the products that we touch and see every day, they're made in very different types of supply chains. Um, I actually very regularly refer um, artisan groups or brands that are interested in sourcing from artisan groups to Fair Trade Federation because their program is better set up to support these types of supply chains. Um, for us in, at the factory program, um, we um, only certify four wall facilities that are factories. Um, and because of the really big upfront investment, in a lot of these factories, um, for perspective, uh, it takes about a year to get the factory meeting or factory standard before they can be certified. So that means um, 
regular engagement from our consultants in country that are working with these factories to help them improve their conditions so that they can be certified. And then a lot of on the ground support to go through this, this election process, this needs assessment, this implementation of projects. Um, if you think about it, a lot of our factories have um, hundreds and or thousands of workers and they're buying washing machines for um, working communities that are across eight different villages. So you can imagine what the distribution of, of 800 washing machines to nine different villages that are hours apart looks like. It requires a lot of work. Uh, so in these larger scale operations, it does um, require bigger brands because there's more people that need more impact. And um, so I think that it's integral that we have different organizations that specialize to fit the needs of our different supply chains. Um, my previous community um, for previous work was working with artisans in Thailand. And so I love, I've always admired and loved Fairtrade Federation and what we do at Fairtrade USA for apparel is just a different set of, um, ways of getting at uh, the same mission, which is making sure that people have safe and dignified jobs um, so they can better their communities. So I hope that circled it, it all back. Yeah, thank you for, for that, Allison. Um, for, yeah, and for both of you for tackling that. I know it can be a tricky question and, and a complicated balance to figure out what, what it, all of this means within fair trade. Um, so a really good place to end on um, as we hit the end of our hour. Um, so I do just want to share uh, a couple of resources for anyone who has any additional questions, follow up. Um, you can find more information from, um, from us, Fairtrade Campaigns, from Fairtrade USA, Matza Traders, um, also including here the websites for Fairtrade Federation and Fashion Revolution if you're curious to, to learn more about that work. Um, and so please just keep the, the conversation going in your, in your communities, wherever you are, um, and join the conversation online and follow up with any questions that you might have um, at the, the email addresses listed here. Um, so, so thank you again to Janit Bookheim and Allison Fight for, for sharing all of that background and expertise. Um, and wishing everyone a very happy Fashion Revolution Week.